you will be able to have access to uh, a chat uh, uh, panel and a Q&A panel. If you click on the Q&A icon, you will then be able to ask uh, questions. So feel free at any point to uh, type in questions you would like addressed finalists throughout the talk, and when we get uh, to that part of the presentation, we will uh, be answering questions. Okay. So uh, I'm Ben, and then I'll, I'll pass the uh, baton over to Dr. Brout, who will then do so with Dr. Kumar. Full setting and, and getting us all on the same uh, page here. Uh, this, but we'll just make sure we're all on the same page, that, that people who are having difficulties with misophonia um, really uh, are a wide variety of different people. And as I've said, this particular uh, webinar has a whole lot of different individuals who in one way or another are affected by misophonia from the individuals, parents, family members, clinicians, uh, as well as teachers, school personnel, and others. As we are beginning to do research on misophonia, that uh, it involves a real complex of different systems in the body. I'll be speaking much more in detail about this soon. But the part of it is that misophonia involves neurological systems in the brain, auditory processing systems in the brain, and as we'll talk about soon, other uh, the system components throughout the body are linked to the brain. And it's I'm thinking about something that is newly coined, like misophonia is a relatively newly coined term. It's hard to know what to call it. Uh, is it a disease? Is it a disorder? Is it a syndrome? Is it a condition? Um, at this point, point, there isn't sufficient research to clearly call it one thing or another. What we're doing for the purpose of this talk is we'll, we'll call it a condition. And one way to think about this is that it is perhaps best thought of as a neurophysiological condition. Neurophysiological, uh, broadly referring to uh, something that's directly impacted by uh, functions of the nervous system. I'll tell you all uh, on, uh, on this webinar what we're talking about here, but here's a list uh, of some of the common Sounds that we know clinically and we know from, from the preliminary research on misophonia are quite common. And you'll hear a bit of a theme where most of what we're learning is that misophonia appears to be uh, really related to sounds that are bodily in nature. So chewing, uh, coughing, but it also is to be related to sounds that are repetitive. So clean noises, board tapping, finger tapping. It's uh, we all of the sounds quite perfectly figured out, but we are we are beginning to try to characterize what they are, and we'll talk some in a few minutes about what exactly this group is doing towards that end. In thinking about the misophonic response, one way to think about this is that, that this is really a, a aversive or a very very unpleasant response to specific pattern-based sounds, which sometimes are visual, uh, less of the loudness of the sound. We don't think that misophonic sounds are uh, misophonic because they're loud. We think that there are other properties that are driving the uh, response. Sound can be loud. A trigger sound can be quiet. Uh, trigger sounds can be elicited by other people, which, as we know, commonly are, but they also can be elicited from animals or uh, inanimate objects. Tenses that we are learning uh, are occurring in response to these, these sounds. Uh, we think we can break these down into, into different buckets. It's probably not appropriate to think that there's only one response. Uh, we, we know that everyone is quite unique and different and has very different uh, kind of patterns of response. So responses to triggers can include intense physiological and cognitive reactions. All are very, very rapid. Uh, many of these reactions are without conscious thought. So uh, like a, a max almost, just a, it can be a very instant reflexive response. 
we are learning that this involves emotional distress, urge to flee, anger, lust, even of rage, panic, anxiety, uh, and really a wide variety of others. The, the, the research literature is really point to anger and disgust and anxiety as the kind of primary emotions that we're seeing, if them a, a label. Clearly, we also see that uh, in response to triggers right away, there is an immediate cascade of cognition, so it's the thoughts, worry thoughts, to be concentrating, uh, self-blame or blaming others, uh, and a wide variety of different distressing thoughts. And then into emotional, biological, cognitive, we are seeing that there's immediate behavioral responses. And what we uh, and you all are quite familiar with as the kind of prototypical behavioral response, which often involves um, immediately trying to escape, avoid, or, or leave uh, to, to kind of move or move oneself from the from sound. But it could include verbal responses, aggression, aggressive responses towards self or others, or inanimate objects, uh, include anything at all, really, that could be conceived of as aggressive, including things such as giving somebody a, a dirty look, uh, making a face. Thinking about emotional, cognitive, and behavioral, there's a wide variety of different responses, and that's, that's kind of the key to take home point there. It's not just one. one. So uh, we also know that in the responses to misophonic triggers, we're seeing that uh, it vary within people. So responses may be different on some days than other days. That could to any number of different factors associated with um, how, how kind of biologically vulnerable that individual is. So if that person hasn't slept well or is, is sick, uh, hasn't taken usual medications or really hasn't attended to themselves physically, that person could be in a more vulnerable biological state and therefore may perhaps be more likely to be uh, triggered. So see that uh, sometimes people as children can hold it together, really, um, you know, really cope in a contained way, and then later on they might um, have a much harder time, uh, they feel safer or more comfortable. And all of this, uh, but we do, we do actually think, and, and um, doctors and Kumar and I are, uh, are working with other to build a to, to do a study right now where we're trying to understand what the properties are uh, of these misophonic triggers. We're doing this with our colleague Mercedes Erfarin, and we are um, really hopeful that we will be able to be understanding why certain sounds. What is it about the certain sound properties that are affecting uh, individuals? Uh, we know it's it's true that some people do better with certain Environment. Some people are able to prevent having a strong misophonic reaction by um, having noises in their background, loud noises, to task the quieter noises. And of course, some people can't do that well. Some people have difficulty uh, they try to do that. It, it can make it worse. All environment that someone is in can affect the sound properties. So if you're in an environment where sound carries, it, of course, may be more difficult. Uh, in other environments, right? Sound travels differently in indoors versus outdoor settings. Um, and simply the take home message here in getting everyone oriented is that, that we actually just don't know yet enough scientifically to understand what certain responses across people and across contexts. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough scientific data at this point to really tell us very important answers uh, to the questions that people have about why and, and what is going on. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to I'm going to pass the pawn here over to Dr. Rout, who uh, take us through a couple of uh, additional slides to level set, and then we'll move on to Dr. Kumar's uh, study. Jeff? Yes, thank you, Zach. So why are these particular sounds triggers? Is the next question. And research has not yet identified why people with misophonia share these particular triggers, but it is extremely important that the sound together 
um, within. Um, and I think that one of the features are, again, are the, that they're based and often repetitive. And what is remember about one reactivity is that when you hear a sound, and this is of anybody, not just people with misophonia, we hear a sound, we automatically alert to it. It's part of our greater defensive motivational system and enables us to survive. So we're supposed to alert to sound. And it's an automatic, non-conscious process that occurs in milliseconds without the nervous, within the nervous system. Um, it meant in some way, just broadly speaking, people with misery are misinterpreting the sounds as harmful or toxic. Now, if one is alerted to a sound and go process that isn't dangerous or potentially harmful, we just add in the background and react with less intensity as the sound continues to repeat. This is auditory gating. One of the theories about misophonia is that some people don't automatically gate. And this may be part of the picture. So what are the causes of misophonia? And of course, Kumar will speak more to this. I will, but just very briefly, it may be related to atypical connectivity between the auditory brain areas and the parts of the brain that process emotion, which very broadly speaking is called the limbic system. And I'm to just speak briefly about the parts of the brain and leave most of that to Dr. Mar. But we know that the amygdala is involved at some point because the amygdala mediates the fight-flight response. And we know that we do get that autonomic nervous system arousal, which may lead us into fight-flight when listening to a particular sound that we find noxious or harmful. And moving along, this is just a picture of the nervous system. And you see we've got a circulatory system, a nervous system, that's the little green guy, respiratory, digestive, and skeletal. So as you can see, the nervous system is quite dense throughout the body. So it is no matter that when we are triggered, we feel a lot of different things within our body. Just briefly, the nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spine. That's called the central nervous system. It has a large network of nerves that allow communication to take place throughout the body. And this system is called the peripheral nervous system. Branches of the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. And that's what I was speaking about a little bit before. And as you can to run the name, autonomic, this is an involuntary physical re neurophysiological response. And when we hear trigger sounds, or if a person without misophonia, for example, was feeling under threat in some way, the into the response and involuntary changes occur. And again, this is related to what you would know as fight flight. And just another small thing to point out, within the MS, it has two branches. One is the sympathetic branch, and one is the parasympathetic branch. The system known to be involved in fight flight is the sympathetic. So that is what is happening when you re respond to a trigger sound on your sympathetic nervous system is upulated, you feel physical events, perhaps your heart beating, perhaps swimming. there is uh, the stress hormone quality is released, and then about what is happening may be more conscious, and the system makes the fight flight is called the parasympathetic system, and that is sometimes called the rest digest system. So when we hear a trigger sound, we go into this immediate autonomic nervous system aroused state where we feel these physiological elements like heart beating and sweating. We may actually call that, call that fear, 
Some people may actually break down and cry. So the behavioral and the cognitive reactions to the physical or neurophysiological reactions do vary. Okay. So I feel so out of control when I have misophonia. So the way you feel when you hear a trigger, again, it's attributed to the sympathetic branch of the ANS. It acts automatically without any conscious thought in response directly to the auditory stimuli or the trigger sound. And again, in milliseconds, and it's simultaneously accompanied by thoughts and emotions, and it motivates behavior. But we feel so out of control because this response is so overwhelming, and it is so difficult to control. Also, many people ask, why does my child feel so out of control? Why does my child behave as though they are so out of control? Now, just special considerations. For example, children may have more difficulty with misophonia than adults because of the following points. First, they're developing the more advanced reasoning skills that adults have, so they can't really reflect upon the response and say, oh, okay, that's my them going into overdrive. They all may not have the language development necessary to express what is happening to them and how they feel. So they also may feel intimidated or afraid or confused to tell an adult what they are experiencing. And one of the things, just clinically speaking, that we find is that some children try to sort of control themselves and they don't really speak to anyone about it. And all of a sudden, they come out and say, I can't stand these noises, or their parents or teachers might notice that they're very distracted during certain times, and then people start to put together and think it's funny. Also, children, and more so in the case of adolescents, have to deal with their experiences somewhat, sometimes in a more hidden fashion, because they may be socially stigmatizing. And that's unfortunate and something, of course, we all want to work on. Some other common questions about misophonia. People always ask genetic. And the answer is we don't know. I've not studied that. However, it does appear just clinically or anecdotally speaking to run in families. And important to think about genetics is genetics are looked at differently today than they were 10 years ago, 15. And a gene or genes can actually be turned on or off, off by environment. You may be born with the, the gene or genes for something, and it may manifest in me till I'm 20, or it may, and it may manifest in my sister when she's Six. So, this onset in a different light. So, the question: Do you typically a lot of people talk about the spreading? If I have them in the office when I didn't before, when we had them at home, does that mean they're spreading? And that's the best way, really, to look at this. There isn't any evidence that states. If you have misophonia and you have just two triggers, that it's going to get worse and worse. More likely, it's going to vary depending on if you're tired, if you're not feeling well, and the kinds of things that Dr. Rosenthal was going over before. That speak of onset. One sometimes called the psychiatric disorder, and at other times a neurological disorder or auditory. Well, unfortunately, classification is not perfect. And most psychiatric disorders have a neurological component and very hard to distinguish what it should be called. But again, we feel neurophysiological gives it the best description. Why is it in the DSM, the diet? and statistical manual. Some of you may know what that is. Some of you may not. For those who do that is 
the book psychiatrists and psychologists diagnose, classify and diagnose mental disorders and sometimes developmental disorders as well. It is because, and this is important for people to know, know this um, is revised every 10 years and then sometimes advised or within the 10 years. So a very long revisional process that done with many teams of psychiatrists, psychologists, specialists in their field, and it's a slow process to get this order into the DSM. There's a lot of things that go into that that include studies have to be done, studies that are experimental in design and in population of people, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. Should someone with misophonia use earplugs, headphones, or in-ear noise generators? Many audiologists say that if you do what's plugging, so like using earplugs to block sounds, that it may actually make one more sensitive sounds. And that's something that Debated and is certainly not answered for this particular disorder. However, having said that, my opinion with people with misophonia and having it myself and know it pretty well through some other of my family members is that you have to do whatever you can do if you are at the point where it's impairing your life greatly. A lot of people are. So I don't think the jury's out in terms of whether or not to use earplugs, headphones, or in ear generators. But I think that it's individual choice, or if you're a parent, it's a choice you should make informed, of course, by audiologists and other doctors. So what can I do if I have misophonia? Yeah. The thing is, the disorder, to the extent that we understand it, as well as you can. Um, if you want to use credible sources, and in the age of the internet, that's difficult because, of course, you know you can Google misophonia and you'll get several different descriptions and opinions. And opinions vary from, you know, from all parts of the world. People with misophonia, people without misophonia, doctors different opinions. This is just unfortunately the way things are now. So it is hard to parse through what is, what is not credible. So a second point, seek help from quality professionals. You know what you're all thinking. That is easy. And it's true, it is not easy. Because unfortunately, as you all I'm sure know, there are not a lot of people in terms of doctors or, or therapists or you know, a primary uh, physician who really understand what misophonia is. Again, the infancy of the research, so it, you know, the awareness level, um, you know, is not high, though it is certainly getting higher. And learning and implementing coping skills is what we're suggesting in search reveals real treatment and methodology. So let's go over some coping skills quickly that you should seek out when seeking out a clinician. Understanding from a physiological perspective, so for example, understanding that sound may be misinterpreted by the brain as dangerous or anxious or harmful. Understand how that works to the best of your ability because it makes one feel less overwhelmed when response is actually happening. Happening, and to some will deconstruct the response, which Rosenthal did in the beginning when he spoke about the cognitive, the emotional, and the physiological. Deconstructing that response, that response that happens so instantly or so instantaneous, so become aware of the physical sensation.
conversations, the cognitive, which are the thoughts that you have, and, and differentiating the sound from the people who generate it. So I'll say, here is my biggest trigger. And while there is possibly a dynamic component or psychological component that then and on top of the physiological response, it's to think of it more as immediate physiological or neurophysiological response to auditory stimuli. And to take out the extra emotional baggage that comes with the person to whom you are talking about who is in And very simply, uh, things just replacing negative thoughts with more neutral ones. For example, many of us say, why is this person doing this to me? This is the first thing that kind of pops into our head after we start to feel that physiological response. We feel our heart beating. We feel the emotion we call angry, or we may feel overwhelmed and start crying. And many people think things like, why is this person doing this to me? And one of the things that's helpful is to try to replace those thoughts with, it's the bothering me, it's not the person. It helps with relations with others, not a miracle treatment. Every little bit helps. And in seek clinician, someone who in your child or your family learn practical strategies. Practical strategies are those that are individualized for either an individual or a family. And practical strategies may include, you know, when to avoid sounds, when to use earphones or inner ear noise generators, and how to specifically handle particular situations in terms of school or the workplace, the car, the car is a big one for families, and so on. How to help. Well, as I said before, there are only a small number of doctors and therapists who are aware of misophonia and understand it, but I want to reassure you that, again, awareness is increasing. We are doing a lot of reaching out as are people who suffer with misophonia. And meantime, and this is important, don't be afraid to share information that you have with a practitioner. There's nothing wrong with printing out something that you read that you feel is a reliable source and showing that to your practitioner, whether it's an audiologist or a therapist or your primary physician. That when you are in touch with doctors of any, and therapists, that they're willing to consult with others who are more familiar with misophonia. If somebody's not willing to consult, then, then you assume that they're not going to be that much help to you. And resources at the end that you can utilize for both your own information and about misophonia and also to share with your doctor. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Kumar. He is a neuroscientist at the University College of London and Newcastle University. He received a PhD from Newcastle University in 2004. And he researches brain mechanisms of auditory perceptions, cognitions, and emotion, and he has published over 30 peer-reviewed articles in neuroscience journals. I'm very happy to pass the ball to Dr. Kumar. Hi, um, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just um, take you um, through the study that uh, we have just recently published. Um, in the journal called Kern Biology. Um, so the title of my presentation is a Neurobiological Basis of uh, Misophonia. Uh, give you a little background as to how we got interested in misophonia. Um, um, you know, uh, we are interested in understanding how the brain processes emotions, and emotions particularly from sound. So in a study that uh, we published in 2012, how the brain responds to annoying sound, for example, screaming nails scratching on blackboard and, and, and so on. Um, and actually after this uh, study was published, um, it also got a bit of attention from the press 
and I was um, an ABC interview actually. And after the interview was over, um, I was flooded with emails asking me, "Do I know how the do anything about mesophonia, or, or do I know how?" the uh, sound of eating, breathing, and chewing are processed in the brain, and so on. So as I said, we didn't know about misophonia until uh, that point. And since these emails uh, kind of keep coming, and we were kind of really intrigued by, by these ones, because our response was, well, maybe, you know, we don't find these sound as, you know, kind of irritating or annoying. Uh, but since these emails kind of keep coming, so we were kind of forced to look at, you know, what's really going on here. Um, so misophonia is quite intriguing because, you know, here are certain sounds which are considered quite normal. People think, you know, most of the people think, oh, they're, they're fine, you know, they're fine with them. Um, but they kind of evoke such a strong and negative emotional response. Um, so... As a, as a first step, actually, my lab is headed by Professor Tim Grit, who is also a neurologist. Um, so he attends both the hospital and also uh, directs the research group. So the first step, we invited four people um, to his cognitive neurology clinic in Newcastle and also in, in London. He uh, conducted the interviews and, and they assessed uh, clinically. I'm really surprised as to how striking uh, the profile was, a profile of symptoms and how do they respond and what kind of triggers were there and and how they respond and so on. And they were very similar across um, the, the people who interviewed. Um, so as I said, this provided, us, uh, this provided the, the motivation to, to, to go ahead. And we designed a questionnaire um, asking a lot of questions about at what age they notice the onset of their symptoms, what are the typical triggers, and how do they respond to those triggers, and, and how you know whether it is you know it has to be sound of a stranger or a family member and so on. So we um, then um, uh, we then consulted a a misophonia support website uh, run in UK, and, and we posted this questionnaire uh, on. Site. Uh, probably within a period of over one month, I about 160 questionnaires uh, in, um, and and we we analyze the data uh, from these questionnaires. And here are some of the numbers that we we collected um, from questionnaires, and this was kind of published as a little abstract in in a journal in 2014. We found the age of sufferers was from 12 to 70 years, and the mean age or the average age was 34 years. The age at which they noticed the symptom first varied from 5 to 50 years. So you can see the the, the, the lower age is really, really like, like you know five years, and the mean age or the average age was about 12 years. 79 percent of the 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 questionnaires uh, or the 79 of the the parts of females. 93% of these questions describe eating sounds as their dominant triggers. 6% of them describe anger as the dominant emotion. There were other emotions included, for example, panic and anxiety and so on. It would leave the situation which, which produced uh, these trigger sounds. As, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, also informed by some some of them that you know the, the, the disorder existed in with the family. So close family members also had the similar symptoms. So that actually went through this analogy clinic and then look at the responses from the questionnaire, then we went on to the next step, the major step, conducting a brain imaging study because you know we have to really justify why we are doing this study and so on. So we had the motivation and also we had some preliminary data collected uh, to basically go to go on for the for the fMRI studies. So in fMRI study, uh, fMRI, if you don't know, is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's a eye scanner that is, you know, you might have seen in the uh, in, in, in hospitals. So, so I have 
have this um, scan here, so we can get. So from right, we can measure the brain activity as you are listening to the sound. So so uh, so so we can monitor your brain activity uh, using fMRI. In the experiment, and in the experiment, we had three sets of sound. So the one set of sound, the misophonic or the free sound, and these sounds based upon the responses from the questionnaire. There was the sound of eating, somebody crunching apple, drinking water, breathing, and, and so on. So these are the trigger sounds. So that was one set of sound. Then we had a second set of sound. These are the unpleasant sound or the normal annoying sound, which everybody finds annoying, for example. So somebody screaming, baby crying, and, and so on. Um, and then we had the third set of sound, the neutral sound, you know, which says annoying at all, uh, the sound of sound of rain, for example, and so on. The idea behind using three uh, sets of sound, or particularly misophonic and unpleasant, was to can make a dissociation between normal annoyance, the subjective experience of feeling, uh, subjective experience of listening to annoying sound, is whether it is different or is the same as um, the, the misophonic uh, sound produced in, in people with misophonia. Um, initially, we were also sure uh, how are they going to respond in the MRI scanner because if you've seen this scan, it's a very narrow space actually. So it will kind of down still within the kind of like a darkened environment. So it's, it's not a good place to be in. So uh, so we were initially worried as to you know, how the people with misophonia with having such a strong negative reaction would respond within that environment. So we kind of um, arranged uh, this study in two visits. So in the first visit, uh, we kind of just measured their skin conductance response. So skin conductance is your uh, autonomic nervous system response. When you feel aroused, for example, this uh, this activity goes high. So we just put two contacts on your finger and we just measure how nervous or how aroused you are when listening to the sound. So we played the sound to them in the visit. And and mental um, autonomic uh, nervous uh, nervous system response. Um, so and after they finish, you know, after they listen all the sound and rate it, and they also tell us, you know, how uh, distressed they felt when they were listening to the sounds. After this part was done, we took them to the MRI scanner, and without playing any sound within the MRI scanner, we got the structural scan. So this is a typical scan that. You that you get uh, in the in the hospital, for example. So doing anything, they have to just lie down still. And what we do is just they take some pictures of the brain just to get how the structure of their brain looks. That's all. Uh, no sound played inside. Of course, the MRI scan has its own noise, but we delay any any trigger sound or any neutral sound or uh, uh, the sound that we selected. So I this one actually they got familiar with the sounds and they also familiar to the MRI environment, and you know we ask them after this these two parts. Then in the first visit, you'd be happy to listen to the trigger sounds in the MRI scanner in the next visit. So, so in the second visit, when they agreed, okay, are they are happy, they can they tolerate those sounds. So they came for the second visit. Second visit, uh, so they stayed where uh, they went inside the MRI scanner. And so they are lying still inside the MRI scanner, and we give them a button. Uh, we give them a, a, a kind of button box. It had four buttons on it. And so uh, lying down inside, so they have headphones on, and they listen to this sound. So this is how the paradigm looks like. Listen to the sound for 15 seconds. One could be one of the three sounds that we select. It could be trigger sound or unpleasant sound or the neutral sound. And after the sound has finished, the help of that button box give us two ratings. So the ratings are uh, on a scale. So uh, the button box had four four buttons on it. <clears throat> so one was basically one means uh, tell them okay you give us the uh, and how annoyed you felt when you were listening to that sound. So one means uh, when they press the button one, it means it wasn't annoying at all. And four, when they press the four, it was very annoying to them. And it could be anything between one and four. Uh, 
In the second rating, they told us how um, for the noise, but think about your mesophonic reaction. So when you, for example, if you have listened to this sound in your day life, how do you think the mesophonic action would have been triggered by this sound? The first was like very general annoyance. doesn't matter what type of annoyance it is. The second was specific to the mesophonic reaction. So it was to again make a distinction between the between general annoyance and the and the the mesophonic annoyance. And you know the, this is a period of uh, rest here, and then again after after about eight to twelve seconds, another sound comes on, and then the process basically repeats and so on. This is some of the the data that we collected from the uh, by basically noting their button presses. So here are the three sounds here, trigger sound, origin sound, and neutral sound. And this is the rating that they gave here. Uh, so this one is when they are giving their mesophonic distress rating. So you have the trigger sound produced a high, dress, a high distress, the average, this is average across all the participants. Uh, so you can see it's, it's up to, uh, slightly more than three on an average. The origin sound produce any uh, mesophonic distress, so not mesophonic uh, to them. So uh, show clear difference between the mesophonic reaction and the unpleasant sound. And the sound, of course, were the neutral. But look at the annoyance of the trigger sounds. Um, trigger sounds were annoying. To, to them, but pleasant sounds were also annoying. So the pleasant sounds were annoying, but were not producing mesophonic distress. The sound, of course, were producing mesophonic distress. So the clear distinction between the uh, between the subjective experience uh, of distress that they feel when they hear the trigger sound or the or the unpleasant sound. So what do uh, they basically got the data and then. We, we basically also compared how people with uh, without misophonia would respond to the same set of sounds. So basically, um, the same experiment with people who did not have misophonia and compared how the brain activity between the two groups, uh, that is the group with misophonia, um, looks like compared with people who don't have misophonia. So, so just give you a summary of the result. Um, forget about this GLM word, we say like a technical word uh, we use for analysis. So the analysis is when we analyze the brain data, we, we found that there was high activation um, in the misophonic group compared to controls. Control means people who don't have misophonia when listening to trigger sound. So we found that their brain was highly active, more active in general. When listening to trigger sound, and trigger sound did not produce uh, or produce much less activation in the control group. A structure in the brain called anterior insula. I'll show you the, the figure of that. Um, so, in particular, the structure uh, was more active, and interestingly, the activity of this structure varied in direct proportion to the distress they felt. So, for example, they had a mild distress, the activity of this structure was less. If it was very severe, the structure, the activity of this structure went high. So it's kind of varying in direct proportion to the perceived phonic distress. So what does this structure do? Uh, the role of this structure um, um, in brain. So we know that uh, this anterior insula uh, structure is known to integrate signals from the body. For example, the all signals from your body, uh, uh, from the from the of your body, basically, all of them are integrated. So if you listen to a sound, and that sound activate my my heart also goes up. So heart activity and the sound activity, both of them would be coming and meeting in the interior insula. You can say that your internal world and the external world, can both of them meet in this structure called anterior insula. So it's a prominent structure um, um, 
for uh, integrating the signals, the free signals from the outside and the sensor signals from your body within. Uh, there is a very large body of evidence which shows that interior insula in, is in subjective feeling. So, for example, in our day-to-day day -day life, for example, sometimes we feel high, sometimes we feel low, and so on. And, and if you could measure your uh, insula activity, you would the insula activity fluctuates in relation to how do you feel, your subjective feeling. Um, so, so there's a, uh, um, if you want to read more about it, uh, the reference that I gave you, uh, so there's a lot of body of evidence now showing that it is to your feelings uh, from from the body. So we think is that basically this evident activation, why I'm, why I'm calling it aberrant because, you know, probably we won't just see it in the other people who don't have misophonia, aberrant activation of this interior insula to the sound, Insomnia is therefore consistent with the known role of anterior insula in emotion processing and in interoception. So the interoception is basically your bodily signals, how you perceive your bodily signals, how your bodily signals are represented in the brain, that's called as interoception. So interoception and there's extraception. Extraception means uh, representation and, and, and perception of signals from outside world, extraception and interception is from the body within. So basically, uh, the, the, this structure is very well known uh, in interception and in emotion processing. Just a picture that I just wanted to show you. Uh, so this is a structure uh, called anterior. This is the structure where you see this blob here, the third blob. This is the anterior insula. So see, this structure is kind of like uh, deep inside, uh, below the cortex here, if you know a little bit of brain anatomy. I just want to show you how the activity in this structure looks like. So there's, you know, the sections of the brain here. This is from the left side and then go to the right side. Um, so just look at this graph here. Um, so I have plotted uh, the activity of and here insula, this structure here, this, this structure which is represented here in the figure, all the three sets of sound. See the trigger sound, and the color is for people who don't have misophonia, the blur is for people who have misophonia. So there are the two colors here, uh, blue for misophonics and red for controls. So see for the trigger sound, in the control group or in people who don't have misophonia is much less and the, the, the height of this bar for the phonic group. So it's much, much high for trigger sound uh, in a phonic subject. But compare the unpleasant sound, the other sound, the unpleasant sound, you can see that the activity in people with misophonia and without misophonia is identical. There is no difference between them. And also when they listen to the neutral sound, there is no difference in people with misophonia and without misophonia when they listen to the neutral sound. So the interesting thing is it's only specific to the trigger sound and not to the sounds in general. So the other kind of the point of the story that it's not like they are hyperactive to all sounds. It's not like their brain is over to all possible sounds. It's some specific sound which for which the knee is hyperactive. So I've done actually in both, so these are, there are two insula, there's a left, left on the left side and there's also insula on the right side and the similar story is there on the right side also. And this is the point that I was telling you that the activity in the anti insula is weighing in direct proportion to the mesophonic stress. So this mesophonic rating that the people gave us by putting a button inside the MRI scanner, so one, two, three, four, four mean very high distress, one is very less distress, and this is the activation or the activity of the NT insula. And you can see how linearly it is. You know, high distress means very high activity, less distress means less activity, uh, less activity. And you can see the story very similar on both sides. Now, ask the question, okay, then why we think that the insula is hyperactive in Mizan? Can, can we go a step further? So we did actually, rather than just looking at the activity of individual structures,
structures, we also looked at how the different structures of the brain are talking to each other, how they are communicating to each other. So that's called connectivity analysis, how they are connected to each other. So from that, uh, I, I'll not go into the details of this matter, how we analyze that, but we found that anti-insula is hyper-connected, or it, be, it was much more strongly connected. When I say hyper, I'm saying if the people who don't have misophonia. All this is all relative to people with, uh, you know, uh, related to the control group. So we found that the anti-insula is um, hyper-connected to two cells in the brain, so for if, if you can't remember these names, it's fine. These are called posterior cingulate cortex, and there's a structure in the front part of your brain, uh, ventral prefrontal cortex. So these are kind of like very um, long words. So there's need to remember these, these words. But the interesting thing to point is that these two structures, one in the back of your brain, so if you look at the middle uh, in the mind of your brain, and look at the front part and the back part, so these are the two structures lying. And these two structures are very well known for recording your past experiences. If I ask you to, uh, call, okay, when you were, say, uh, nine year or 10 year old, and I ask you what type of music you like the best, can you just call the music that you heard? Or I ask you any episode of your memory, you know, um, you would call what experiences, what kind of people you met at your birthday party, and so on. So I think if you want to recall your past experiences, your personal past experiences, these just would go hyperactive. Right? Without playing any stimulus from outside, if you just recall your past experiences, uh, these structures would be active. And that these structures were basically tightly connected or more strongly connected to the anterior insula only when they were listening to the trigger sound. So interpretation is that when they listen to the, when the misophonic people listen to the trigger sound, these are all your past bad experiences, past aversive experiences with the trigger sound, they come basically together and drive the anterior insula hyperactive. So that is the, that is one of the reasons that we see that the, the anterior insula was much more hyperactive um, in people with misophonia in response to trigger sound compared to controls. So Dr. Kumar, these... I'm going to just uh, briefly just inject and um, highlight we only have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure there is some time, if possible, for uh, you to sure, answer sure. questions. Sure, uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, uh, I have probably my this is last slide, I think. So we also found uh, there was an increased heart rate. Uh, so example, we were also monitoring their heart rate and we monitoring their skin response. So their heart rate also went up uh, listening to the trigger sound when the misophonic people were listening to trigger sound. Uh, and that kind of explained that why they were more aroused uh, when they're listening to the trigger sound. And interestingly, the bodily responses of your increased heart rate they are also driven by the uh, anterior insula. So we think that this hyperactivity of this structure called anterior insula, combined with this hyperconnectivity, that underlies misophonia. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Kumar, for that presentation. And we have um, many, many excellent questions. I'm doing my best to keep up. And I apologize if I've not yet gotten to um, uh, the questions. I know there's a number I have not yet responded to. Um, the question, Dr. Kumar, for you in the Q and A uh, about your presentation that um, has to do with uh, what control group was mostly women. Um, someone was it mostly women? It seems that the onset is around pretty mostly affects women and does estrogen play a role in this any any brief thoughts on that yeah um, so so uh, we had actually uh, we had a group of 22 um, people with misophonia and I think about 14 of them were women and eight of them were men and the control group basically the they were uh, tightly so we had the same number of or probably the same number of female and male basically so, so, so women 
they, they were both matched. Um, so regarding the um, regarding the onset at the puberty time, I think probably at the, there is no data to suggest that. So probably I can't say that. But but definitely, the, uh, you know, the, if you look at the age of onset, which is about nine to twelve years, so just coincide with that. So it, it's possible that we need to find out uh, more scientific. There are several questions addressing one general question that I think I can summarize, which is based on your research, pinting areas of the brain that may be very much critical in understanding misophonia, what does that tell us about potential uh, medication or other treatment uh, development? What, what, what do you say at this point based on your study, and what do you think needs to be done? So I think probably there are of uh, possibilities. So one set I'm currently planning is uh, so fMRI is, is quite ex um, uh, quite an expensive uh, machine to measure your brain activity. Uh, so one set that I'm currently running is, for example, uh, can we use maybe something cheaper device like EEG, which is kind of routinely used, not ex as expensive as MRI scanner, uh, and can maybe um, monitor your brain activity. And if I display your brain activity in front of you in the form of an image, can you maybe self-regulate? This is called neurofeedback. So one possibility is that once we get a handle onto as to what brain structures are abnormally responding and what their signals are, so we collect these signals uh, from your scalp and be uh, present to you in the form of an image, okay, where is going up or down, going up or down, and can probably, uh, there are studies that actually do that. And interestingly, for the same structure called anterior insula, where people have done kind of like a neurofeedback. Uh, so, so one possibility is that one. I mean, another possibility would be that now we know that the structure is abnormally responding. Others, uh, other therapies, for, uh, other therapies, for example, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. If we want to see whether it really has any impact on your or on your nervous system, so we'll be able to compare what really was before what was after the therapy, so we can see the clear difference between them. So yes, so there are also possible, uh, uh, the, the, the pharmacology also is possible, behavior therapies are also possible. The main point is that unless we have a handle on what brain structure is abnormally responding, I think probably we have a much better chance of understanding what misophonia is and how to control it. Great. I really appreciate that. I know everyone else probably as well that that was a very thoughtful response. We are unfortunately right at one fee, and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We have uh, additional webinars in this series on misophonia, and we look forward to others joining. Uh, the the other thing I want to say before we wrap up, though, is that there are lots of questions that are excellent questions here we've not been able to answer. And I know that uh, for myself, and I believe this is true for the other presenters, we would be able to answer these questions if you want to. To, um, uh, contact us uh, via email. Uh, stick around for a couple more minutes here and try to answer as many as I can uh, on the webinar directly. Uh, thank you, everybody, again. Thank you for your time and participation, and we look forward to our next time with you all together.